We're in a dungeon. We spot an arrow slit a couple inches wide and a trapped pressure plate too big to walk around, which will cause an arrow to fire through the slit at whoever stepped on the plate. GM. So you'll still need to roll a jump check to get over the plate without triggering it. Me. Can't I just block the hole? GM. No. Me. Like, I use the knight's shield and just hold it over the opening, then step on the plate? GM. No! Then you'll step on the plate, so it'll shoot at you. Me. And then plink off the shield, which is covering the hole. GM. No! You're holding the shield, so it might still hit. Shields don't give cover, just AC. Me. Okay, what if I plug up the hole with a rock or something? GM. The arrow will dislodge the rock and hit you. Me. Okay, fine. I'll roll the jump check. This is why people hate traps, because there are GMs that treat them as something specifically designed to annoy the ever-living shift out of your players. Like, seriously. What is the point of having a trap if there's no creative solution surrounding it? If it all boils down to just a random chance that entering a room will just deal damage to you, you might as well just roll a die to see if you hit them every time they open a door. Okay guys, on to the next room. You know what that means. Uh, GM, uh, please not this again. Okay, uh, duck, duck, duck. Oh, Bard, it looks like it's you again. Wait, wait! Ooh, max roll. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. Today, we have two different stories. The first of which is about a D&D game, where a GM goes full gamer mode treating every monster as a stat block, ignoring every attempt for players to roleplay, and, of course, using his game rewards. If you don't know what I mean by that, then bless your heart, as you clearly have never been in a modern warfare lobby in the early days of Xbox Live. <laughs> oh, I just, I spawn die! 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 So, without further ado, let's dig up an old copy of Rainbow Six Three and turn on your Dark Master voice mask as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. A bit of backstory. I grew up with World of Darkness, Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Cyberpunk, and Seventh Sea, among others. I've always had issues with D&D. Found it too mechanical, too stats-driven, and whatnot. About a year or two years ago, I decided to give D&D a try, and bought some of the books. The Player's Guide, DM Book, Xanathar's, etc. With that being said, I do not consider myself an expert in D&D at all, or nothing whatsoever. Thing is, I rather would play a game before DMing it, than just jump into it and running it. So, due to the pandemic, I was looking for online groups, and I meet an interesting D&D group. So a guy invited me to his campaign. It was a low-level thing, and even if I had the books, I hadn't read them other than in a casual glance. I'm more used to playing narrative-driven games than just mechanical ones, so please bear this in mind. The moment I joined in, I decided to play as a bard of the School of the Sword. To my understanding, that meant a bard that could actually fight. I decided to play a bit with the stats, and my character was pretty much done. I was playing a Hispanic bard, since I am also Hispanic. Ooh, samesies. Playing with some of the idea of being a Latin lover type of character. And since my accent was already a bit thick, it wouldn't be too hard to do. I always have some issue with rolling R's, that's the hardest part. Anyway, back to the story. Meet the group. I get invited to a Discord call with the rest of the group. Everyone was a bit... awkward. I'm kind of used to this, considering I've been rolling dice for almost 20 years, and it's kind of normal to find players that tend to be a bit off sometimes. Everyone is talking about stats and shift like that, but that should have been my first red flag. One of the players asks me about my character. I start describing his backstory when one of them interrupts me. Player 1. Oh, you're one of those guys. Me. What do you mean? Player 2. Let me see his stats. Player 3. Dude, your build, like, sucks. You gotta remake your character or else your build's gonna lower our chances. Builds? Was this a flocking WoW campaign or something? Also, let's be real. It's flocking 5e. There are no builds. 
I tend to think of them more like kids. And no, not the fox kind. Aww. Here's an example. In Overwatch, I have a plethora of choices to choose from when I want to pick a DPS character. Would you say that picking Pharah over Reaper is a choice between builds? Or would you say it's a choice between kits? There is a right answer. And it's called playing Path of Exile instead because you have actual builds then. Also, Blizzard can go flock themselves. We will do better going forward. Let's get back to the story. One of the things I hated was the idea of not being able to play my character, and instead following a predetermined build. If I wanted that, I could easily boot up my computer and play Ragnarok online, or something like that. Then the game started. I was a bit weary about the situation, and the GM had no passion for the game whatsoever. He would run the game as if he was doing us a favor. I was used to GMs describing shift on an epic scale, saying things like, The creature, with dozens of eyes, begins glaring and hissing. You could feel a headache as thousands of voices echoed in your head. As this floating, malformed abomination of eyes and a gaping maw stares back at you. But this guy was like, So you guys see a level 15 beholder? He has at least 120 HP. These aren't the exact stats he gave, but just to give you an idea. This was my strike too. Combat. We were faced by a bunch of creatures. Kobolds, I think. And everyone took to position strategically. I saw no problem with that. Then it was my turn. I declared, I draw my sword and jump in the middle of the mosh pit, swinging my sword and trying to make distance, to which I heard the rest of the players sigh with contempt. And then, shift hit the fan. The GM got agitated and started to berate me, screaming, Play your flocking class well, you flocking idiot. You are a bard. You're supposed to stay behind, you piece of shift. I was like, wow, um, but I'm school of the sword. GM, how long have you been playing D&D, you flocking... And then he called me the S-word. Since I'm Hispanic, I was taken aback. I couldn't react. Play the game well. I don't care how they do D&D in Brazil. Play the flocking game well, you piece of shift. I'm not Brazilian, by the way. And I stated that from the beginning when first meeting the rest of them. But they cared too much about their stats and min-max to make any social attempts to reach me. I should have left the game. I know I should have called on his racist BS and call him a f***ing bastard, but I didn't, and I regret that. I continued in the game, but I was more like playing out of spite. I was still in shock, and I went into full automatic playthrough. After the game ended, Everyone got experience points. I was given less experience points, and the players commented that if I learn how to play, they may bring me back again. And if I stopped with that cringy roleplay bullshit. After that, I told a friend about what happened. They said that the GM's attitude was a massive problem, but they were right for me not knowing how to play my class. Ever since then, I've been dodgy about running or playing Dungeons & Dragons. I still get my books out of a collector's instinct, but I'm still not very fond of it. I'm currently playing with a friend, but I'm still a bit weary. The numbers and stats are still a bit of a headache. But yeah, that's my experience. Even though Dungeons & Dragons slants more towards narrative gaming as opposed to all that crunch, it's maddening to see that kind of player or GM pop up. If I wanted to hover over my stats 24-7, attempting to maximize every plus one or plus two, there are far more complex games out there that will scratch that itch better than D&D ever could. But also, flock that greasy neckbeard of a GM. I hope one day he'll dig himself out of his hovel of crushed cans of Mountain Dew and empty bags of family-sized Doritos to realize he flocked up. But it's doubtful. To you, user Joker19, I'd recommend a game like Dungeon World if you're still interested in playing a fantasy TTRPG with less numbers. 
As a professional Olympic math hater myself, I can totally see where you're coming from. Anyway, on to the next story. This next story is by a first-time poster, after his in-person group was unable to meet up. So without further ado, let's desperately look for our final player on Roll20 as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. My first post on this website, as I just learned about it from my friend who told me to post this story. About a month ago, I was really missing playing Dungeons & Dragons as my in-person group wasn't able to meet up due to a plethora of reasons. Regardless, I looked online and found Roll20, which from my understanding is the platform that many people use. I searched for a few days and found a campaign pitch. It sounded really great. The setting was a homebrewed world, with some Tolkien-esque touches, but with a modern take, like adventuring guilds and other features. I applied, and through irony of the destiny I was accepted after holding an interview with the DM. He seemed like a normal fellow, though a bit shy. It didn't matter to me, as most people don't really feel comfortable talking through the internet with a stranger for the first time. I mean, I was also quite nervous about it. So, it is understandable. The DM was interested in my character idea, a life domain cleric, devout of the god of healers, homebrewed by the DM. That was all good. And I spent the next days until our first session properly creating my character sheet. The day of the campaign, I was really excited and was one of the very first people to log into the game's voice channel on Discord. While I waited for the DM, a few other players got into the voice chat, and we talked. They seemed pretty nice, and one of them was a real-life friend of the DM. There were four players. The DM's friend, who was going to be playing a paladin sorcerer multi-class, myself playing the cleric, and two other women who were playing a divination wizard and a swashbuckler rogue. The DM got online, and soon enough, we started the game. That's when the nightmare started. First, he called us by our names, our real names, and started to narrate how our lives would change from otherwise boring and menial to a grand adventure. The next moment, we hear some bells, and he started to narrate how we were going to be transported to a new world. This wasn't what I signed up for but I thought it was just a quirky way to start his campaign. Things didn't get better from there. He put the whole trope into it. Oh, your hero summoned to help our world. I felt like I was looking at a badly written isekai, which now makes me wonder, why didn't I quit the game right there? However, it does get worse. When it came to the point for the whole check for class trope, his friend was deemed a hero and we were the hero's bonds. Yes, you're hearing me right. He wanted us to be his friends, his harem. That's at least what the other players in me thought as we were exchanging private messages. Everything went downhill from here and from that point forward, and when he tried to put us in an embarrassing situation, all three of us quit the game and blocked the DM and his friend. Honestly, I just wanted to play some D&D, not become part of some twisted power fantasy. Oh well. My friend told me I should be less naive next time. I'll take her up on her advice and keep playing with people I know. Yeah, someone's been watching too much anime. How desperate do you have to be to invite three women into your D&D game for the express purpose of making all of them your quote-unquote friends, all bound by weeb magic? to serve only your friend's player character. It's made even worse when you combine it with the whole stranger in a strange land scenario the GM forced these women into. He immediately stripped them of all of their power that they chose in character creation for whatever machinations the DM would come up with later. It wouldn't be a stretch to guess. He'd give them abilities that would force them into being subservient to the DM's friend's character. All in all, Bullet dodged, and to use her viciously dancing, I wish you luck in your next violent tango that lands you into your next game. 
Thank you for tuning in, and a special thank you to the Crow's Perch patrons. My lovely, lovely burbs, Madolci Procchioni and Reuven Gritters. And of course, who'd forget our counts of quills, Haley, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. No day will go by when I ain't talk about my barons and beaks. Cause we're talking about Anya and good old McHeatley. And of course, I ain't gonna let the opportunity fly to not talk about my Duke of Feathers. <laughs> Acroth. And before I go, yes, I remembered Art of the Week. Art of the Week? This week's Art of the Week will comprise of two different pieces. As I forgot about Art of the Week last week, in our first piece, Discord user R6 created my first piece of Only Burbs content based on the opening to a previous video. Shocking, disturbing, yet tasteful. Do not show this under any circumstances to your girlfriend if you plan on keeping her in your roost. And for our second piece, Discord user Burrito made a faithful rendition of R.A. Savator's Driz Do Erden, helping the denizens of the Underdark, also known as South L.A., with a pair of his grandmother's twin chonklas. Thank you to both Burrito and R6 for your submissions. And I promise I won't forget Art of the Week next week. Unless I do. And with that, I'll see you all next time. As the crow flies. <laughs>